evening. Hello. I'm Genevieve Jacobs from ABC Radio, 666 ABC Canberra, and I'm delighted to be here to chair the panel discussion on the myths and miseries of middle age. This is part of National Psychology Week. It's a joint venture between the Department of Psychology here at the ANU and the Australian Psychological Society. And I want to begin, too, by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the first custodians of this land where we sit this night, and whose culture is among the oldest ongoing cultures in human history. We celebrate and acknowledge their presence, and I also acknowledge any elders who may be present this evening. I want to begin the panel this evening by saying that I'm 43 years old. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> but in a broader sense, tonight is all about unravelling the meaning, the mysteries, and the myths of being middle-aged. Although I have to say, I was a little bit bemused by the flyer that went around to promote this event. You've got the men growing ponytails, buying sports cars and going out with 20-year-olds. The women are condemned to overdosing on Valium and mourning the empty nestlings. I really think there's an opportunity for that to go the other way around. Either that or I want to be a bloke, one of those. <laughs> And now look, don't tell me too that you're not all wondering how middle-aged you are, because otherwise, really, what else are you doing here? And the people who've been taking the bookings tell me they've had many a plaintive phone call saying, if I make a booking, that doesn't mean I am middle-aged, does it? <laughs> but seriously though, folks, middle-aged is a time of great challenge, of great transition from youth and vigour to the likelihood of health problems, facing the reality of the ageing body, for women, the end of the reproductive years, and sometimes the heartbreak of having left it perhaps too late to have children, wishing that you'd had more children. It's a time when you can be on top in your career with all the stresses that that can entail, or perhaps on the other hand, suddenly on a job queue and wondering what on earth there is for a 53-year-old. It's also frequently a time for wondering just what course your life has taken, whether what you've done is enough, what your legacy will be. The fact that you are halfway through life itself, I think, prompts that discussion about what do I do from here on in? What do I do to make the rest of my life more meaningful, more truly me? And perhaps that concerns your job, your career, perhaps even your marriage. Is it too late to make it all mean more in the time that's left to us? For some, of course, it's a time when life is finally just absolutely terrific. You're on, on charge, you're on top, you feel absolutely confident, really sure of yourself. So what are the myths and the miseries of middle age? Let me start by introducing you to our panel this evening. To my right, Associate Professor Michael Plato. He's a social psychologist with the Department of Psychology here at the ANU. He's looked widely at how social context determines which identity we present to the world. In other words, perhaps how that devoted company man turns into the hellraiser with a Ferrari when given half a chance and early retirement. <laughs> Dr Christine Phillips is a senior lecturer on social factors and health at the ANU Medical School. She deals with the physical and medical realities of ageing, or why that rager in the Ferrari is going to do his back in with the new girlfriend. <laughs> Mrs Susie Kieser is Miss Susie Kieser is a PhD candidate and her research focuses on occupational stress in middle age. She's looked at how stressful things can be when you're in the midst of the career, perhaps also in the midst of child rearing and under pressure on all sides. Dr Ross Wilkinson has examined relationships and attachments through life. He's with the Department of Psychology here at the ANU. He asks whether middle age is what it used to be. Once a time for nurturing, now also a time for asking, just what have I achieved? What is my legacy? Dr Tim Windsor has been involved with the Path Through Life project at the Centre for Mental Health Research here at the ANU. He's looking at middle age as a developmental stage where the transitions that happen in family and at work can influence your personal life, your growth, your direction. <coughs> Professor Don Byrne, on the end, is from the Department of Psychology. He's spent years looking at stress and its relationship to illnesses many of which are the province of middle age, its uncertainties, the changes that it brings, both physical and emotional. Now, Don is extremely well positioned to take on this topic because as he told me yesterday on the radio, he's middle age, he's absolutely not old. That would be someone about five years beyond him. 
So we're going to begin our panel discussion tonight, and there's also time for questions right throughout the discussion. We've got two microphones positioned here and here. So if you'd like to ask a question, please just raise your hand, catch my eye, and we'll get the microphone to you. Please note, though, that I did say questions, not statements, not rambling, discursive discussions. <laughs> but uh, there's also a fair bit of territory that we need to cover this evening. So do be patient. If you haven't heard me raise something that interests you particularly, then there's every likelihood we will get to it. We're going to try and cover health and well-being, psychological issues, stresses, relationships, the whole gamut. So let's begin, and I want to start by asking the panellists what they think it means to actually be middle-aged. Susie. Okay. Um, I, I guess when we talk about any age, we're really taking into consideration a number of factors. So sure, chronological age, but also life stage, health, uh, capacity to work, our societal contributions, norms and expectations about what we all think middle age is, um, as well as psychological processes. And I think um, Don raised something really interesting yesterday. He said that it was, um, he defined middle age as being on a sliding scale five years above anything that he was. So I think that may also be uh, a sign of middle age. <laughs> Don, would you like to respond? What, what is middle age? Not you. Well, <laughs> Probably being the oldest on the panel, I, I, I can take the prerogative, you see, of, of uh, using that sliding scale. Because one of the important things for me is that uh, any age stage, but middle age possibly particularly, is a state of mind as much as anything else. It's how you think about yourself, it's how you feel about yourself, it's how you define yourself within the context that you live in. And taking a, a, a fixed and arbitrary definition based on an age range, I think, is, a, is an entirely incorrect way of, of, of going. So I happily admit to being middle-aged and probably, you know, well into middle age. But um, middle age is going to progress as, as I get older. <laughs> so, John, at 83, 84... I will still be middle-aged. Middle <laughs> does raise the question of how old you intend being, Don. Well, uh, I, I've always said to my son, that, that I intend to live long enough to be the sort of nuisance to him that I was to my father. Okay. Ross Wilkinson, what's middle age? Um, I think it really has um, changed over time. I think there's been some pretty big shifts um, uh, in the way we construct our lives uh, post-war. If you look now, um, the average age at which people get married for males now is about 30 years of age. About 28. Um, back in my day, when I was a younger man, I remember my, both my sisters were married by the time they were 21 and had children by the time they were 21. So if you kind of think about now, if someone has a child when they're 30, well, by the time they're 40, the child is still only 10 years old, and by the time they're 50, then they're <coughs> kind of 20. So I think the what we classify as middle age has kind of moved. We also know that, that we live longer as well, so that the age of that middle period is extended further. I think complicating it too is that, um, that uh, with each generation, the kind of attitudes we have towards things like employment and relationships are changing. The average length of a marriage now is only about eight and a half years. If you look at the, uh, at the statistics. Now, when you think back to what you think marriage might mean, or what it might have meant for the previous generation, uh, you can see that that might mean something for what you want to think about as being middle-aged. Michael Plato, someone said to me today that 60 is the new 50, which is optimistic. What do you think being middle-aged is? Well, I think that my, my ideas about these have to do with uh, kind of kind of like uh, what Ross was saying. I think that this is a very fluid and, and kind of flexible, but historically fluid and historically flexible thing. So rather than kind of saying to you, there's a definite psychological stage of these ages. These are the things that happen for all people at all times and all cultures. I think that's that's unquestionably wrong. That we have to understand the historical context in which we are, and it's not just about people living longer. It's about um, the economic opportunities we have to achieve goals and so and and to start that family or to pursue other life goals. Those opportunities. So, it, it, so 
our life progresses not in the absence of a social context or an historical context. Our life progresses and is always bound by and constrained in many respects by the historical context and the economic context and the political context we live in and the cultural context. So, middle, so I'm kind of not answering your question, actually, you can see that. But what I'm saying is that I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's fluid and dynamic, and, it, and as I think Don was saying, it's, it's also a, our psychological representation. And that representation, that understanding that we have about our life at any given point in time is going to be bound by these historical and cultural events. So what, whatever we might say today, and I didn't know I was middle-aged until Don told me I was middle-aged. <laughs> so again, and, uh, but... It, it's, so our understanding of it is going to be very, uh, that is uh, each of our, not, not, not the professional understanding, but each of our own subjective experiences of middle age is going to be bound in some ways by the, co the, the cultural and historical context we find ourselves. So that's kind of a, a roundabout answer probably. Uh, Tim Windsor, are you middle aged? Will anyone cop to being middle-aged on the panel? I'm on the cusp. I'm on the cusp. But um, uh, while I agree with what all the other panellists have said, I'm actually going to try and answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> because when we, do, uh, when we do research, sometimes we have to be quite subjective and we have to make a judgement in order to break up our data into little chunks that we can make meaningful comparisons between. And the, the modal entry age of midlife is typically regarded as being around 40 and the modal exit year is between about 60 and 65. So, so until um, Don tells us how old he is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Christine Phillips, is there a medical definition of middle age? Uh, no, there isn't, but let me, let me answer something that other people have said around uh, numbers. I think middle age is probably a time when we become very fearful of numbers. That's the time when people say, I won't disclose my age. I'm 47, so I am middle aged. Um, my 15-year-old son came up with a beautiful way of thinking about this. He said, after you turn 46, you should stop using numbers. So you should be 40 heaven, and then 40 great, and then 40 fine. And, and I thought that was a lovely way of stepping away from the idea that once we hit middle age, we are fearful of those numbers. On your point about a question about is there a medical definition, no, there isn't. But there are some biological verities that kick in around about 50. Everybody who's turned 50 and had their present from the government of their bowel cancer screening test <laughs> <laughs> probably is having to think, ah, oh, that means the government thinks I'm middle-aged. Anyway, this is when mortality starts breathing down our necks. We get the, we access free mammograms at the age of 50. We have to start to think about prostate cancer screening. <coughs> so. Uh, and menopause starts to kick in, and the age of menopause does not appear to have changed. No matter how much we've got older, we still hit menopause, historically, at the same age. So, biologically, these transitions occur in our body, and we start to contemplate the changing of our bodies. Not, that's not a bad thing, uh, at about the age of 50. Surely that's going to vary, though, from person to person. I mean, I would assume that there are some tremendously unfit 30-year-olds and some 47-year-olds who could take them any day. Absolutely, but I wasn't using fitness as a sign sure. of whether you're middle-aged or not. I was actually thinking of the biological transitions that occur. And menopause, I think, is a pretty classic transition. And it's, it occurs in the early 50s. And it occurred in the early 50s centuries ago as well. It would appear. We don't have accounts of people going through menopause in their 30s in the past. And we do not anticipate that in future people will have <coughs> menopause in their 60s. They're going to probably stay where they are at the moment. Can I uh, with, ask you a question? Is that all right? If I, yeah. I mean, I mean the, question, the historical. So, from my perspective, kind of placing this kind of in a social, historical, cultural context, I wonder though. So, I, I have no doubt that women might reach menopause around the same time. Were they considered middle aged or were they considered old? Oh. Okay, so yeah, I think that begins to, yes, to kind yes. of address some of yeah. our, our points here. Yeah. So yes, there's no question that women biologically would reach menopause at a particular age, but what we understand to be uh, middle age may change historically and culturally. Yeah. So, and the way right. that we would view a menopausal woman obviously changed considerably. A 50-year-old woman who's, who's going through menopause now sees herself as having you know, 30, 40 years more of, of active life that's right. ahead of her. That's right, yeah. yeah. So it's a social construct yeah. that's, that's quite different. Mm. Um, Don Byrne, to you, there's, there's a strong connection with, with stress and, and illness that begins to be quite marked in middle age. How does that manifest itself? Well, I think the, the, the connection starts much, much earlier because uh, stress starts to, uh, to biologically affect the body and psychologically affect the mind. 
at pretty much any any age uh, range. We know, for example, that uh, adolescence is is not uh, anywhere near the uh, the stress-free period that a lot of people once thought it was. Uh, we know that early adulthood um, brings with it its own stressors, and, and I could just you know keep talking about that, and I won't. Uh, but the important point is that um, stress begins early uh, and accumulates and its biological effects accumulate. The thing about middle age is that the sorts of cumulative effects that we see of stress don't manifest themselves as illness until middle age. So that, you know, by the time we get to be 50, 55, 60, uh, the, the cumulative effects of stress on the cardiovascular system are starting to show <coughs> themselves. We're starting to, to become hypertensive. Uh, occasionally we will uh, go worse than that and develop coronary artery disease and uh, even go on and have a heart attack. The evidence, uh, I think, on cardiovascular disease is really quite persuasive. The evidence in, in other areas is perhaps not quite so persuasive, but uh, you know, there's still some evidence in, uh, in relation to some of the cancers and so on. So um, you know, I think the, the, the big issue there, Genevieve, is that um, we don't realise necessarily that what we're building up is a, is a profile of risk. Uh, and it's not just a simple stress risk. It's a, a, a risk uh, where stress interacts with things like risk factors, with our tendency to smoke and to smoke more, our tendency to, to eat unhealthy diets and so on and so forth. But the big thing is that often a lot of these things don't become manifest until we're 60, 65 or whatever. It's one of the big problems with, with getting uh, young people to adopt healthy lifestyles. They don't see the salience of doing that because they know that it's going to be 40 years down the track before anything nasty is likely to happen to them. So, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a rather insidious picture when we talk about stress. And, of course, there's also a great deal going on in our lives in this middle-aged period, and, and we see the classic picture of the stressed middle-aged executive who then has the massive heart attack. This is a cumulative effect. Absolutely. And, and the stressors may change over time. You know, the sorts of stressors an adolescent uh, is going to have may well be very different, up in all probability very different from the kinds of stressors that uh, an adult uh, experiences. And middle age, as we've already alluded to, brings with it a, a, a range of stressors in and of itself, particularly late middle age, because then you're starting to look at um, that big transition into, God, I shudder to say it, old age, you know, and, and, and retirement and things of, of that sort, and, and that in itself can, uh, can comprise stressors. You, you touched on, on a, a really big one, I think, early on, and that, was, that is the, um, the unexpected unemployment of, of many people in middle age. Absolutely tragic and uh, can have quite tragic consequences. I think the, you know, the number of case reports of the 50-year-old, 55-year-old coming home having just been retrenched from what he thought, and I think it's typically a male thing, was a, a secure job, uh, and then having an infarct that night. Uh, now, you know, it's a bit difficult to extrapolate from, from case... Uh, anecdotal evidence to uh, anything that would pass as scientific evidence. But I think the clinical uh, picture is, is really clear there. Mm. Uh, Christine Phillips, I guess you would agree that this is the time when the bad habits begin to catch up. Ah, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's the time when you, you think, well, I, if I keep smoking, every time I go to the doctor, they're going to give me a lecture. And uh, a lot of 25-year-olds aren't going to listen to that. But by the time you've hit 45, or um, those lectures are becoming very, very strong. Plus, you've started as well to feel that you can't breathe as well. And the habit of overwork, I think, starts to implode. It starts to cause people to implode in their, <coughs> their 50s. So, what, what are the physical effects of overwork? What do you see? Uh, well, depression is, is one of them, obviously. That's, that's the furthest one, one down the track. But um, people who overwork often have got no notion that they're overworking. They actually think that's just the way life should be. Um, and they, they'll often present with a whole lot of other symptoms. Why do I feel so tired? Why, um, why do I have such pain in my stomach? Why have I constantly got headaches? Why have I got such a short fuse with women? Why, why do I feel so... Like, I'm, why am I weeping at work? Now, that's often interpreted as menopause, but often... It isn't anything to do with menopause. It's actually the habit of overwork and the demand, particularly in this town, of people working far too hard. Mm. I am very happy to take questions. If you want to just pop your hand up, and I think we've got one up there. We'll just get the microphone up to you. Just catch my eye, and because it's a discussion with you as well as a discussion between us, and um, Canberra audiences are always very well informed. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. The face to that beautiful voice on the radio. Thank you for hosting this. Uh, 
One question I was wondering if, so the research which has been done here would be more relevant to this context as in this culture. Would the same research in midlife crisis be relevant in say Southeast Asia or in African countries where the middle age comes much sooner than here? Because people live 60 years and they die. So does it mean that people in Africa would be having midlife crisis at 30? That, that's a really fascinating question. The question is about whether middle age is, is different in different cultures. Um, who would like to tackle that? Um, it's probably, uh, yeah, I, got yeah, I'll, I'll have yeah. a go. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think the answer is probably, but we don't really know. Um, midlife research is a relatively new area in the context of lifespan developmental research. And I think one of the reasons for that is because uh, while we, it's a little easier to make generalizations about the characteristics of development in early adulthood and, and then in late adulthood, whereas midlife is so, uh, is so much more characterized by diversity of experience. And so we may very well see cultural differences in people's experiences in midlife, but even within a culture, there's such a great diversity of experience between those who might um, go through a sort of uh, crisis like experiences and those who are really at the peak of their functioning um, and indeed even within the same person someone might find themselves um, in one domain of their life for example work life really operating at a peak level of high performance but maybe in another area of their life like family things might start to go a little bit pear-shaped so um, I don't think we have an answer to your question but I think it's a really interesting one and I hope that um, growing efforts towards cross-cultural research in areas of development and ageing might be able to help, help us answer that. And I, I think that's yeah, accurate. I think it's completely accurate. But I, what I wanted to add to that was just to kind of some, some conjectures with, without evidence and just kind of say we do understand, as kind of my theme that's coming through here, is we do understand that there are different ways of understanding age. There are different cultures and different, and that's really what your fundamental question is. And I think that you know, there are cultures, and we're aware there's indigenous cultures here and, and cultures around the world. I don't know the specific ones that you've, that you've indicated, but the, the point is that the cult, different cultures see age differently. And so it may be the case that here I am in Canberra and I'm 47 and I'm, I'm really stressed in my job and I don't know if I have the respect of my students or my peers or, and I'm, but maybe in another culture by the time I was 47, I know that, that's, that by that age, I would be a respected, almost an elder, I don't use that term very broadly, but, and so, and so I could sit almost secure in that. And so I don't, I'm not persuaded that there's any <coughs> fundamental psychological necessity that says you will always have a crisis now, Okay, you will always want to run off. It is certainly the case that, you know, uh, impoverished people, well, impoverished people anywhere, impoverished, say, impoverished people in Chad and impoverished people in Canberra are not going to run off at middle age and buy themselves an expensive car because they can't. <laughs> All right, so there's fundamentally, it's not that we're always going to do something silly like that. Maybe it's not, it's something, you know, caricature like that. So I think it's going to depend a lot on our circumstances, our, you know, how, we un, how we collectively, not just personally, so just, we don't exist alone, not just personally, how we collectively construe age and how <coughs> we're treated at that age by others, although I think it's a very important thing. Well, I, I wonder too whether the fact that the role of elder is not very clearly defined in our society is one of the things that prompts this degree of angst about middle age. We, we don't quite know where we're going and how we'll be treated when we are ready to acknowledge we're old. I, I get, I mean, my students here at the university, I get emails from them always do you get this? They're saying, hey Michael, I thought, whatever happened to dear Dr. Plato? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so I'm thinking, is that because I'm looking for respect as a middle-aged man? I don't, you know, maybe when I was 27, I thought the Hey Michael was okay on the emails if I got them, but now I'm kind of saying, and that's the unclarity of what, what, what you're saying. I, I notice among my teenage children's friends a bit of uncertainty as, as to whether to call me Mrs. Jacobs or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't mind being called Mrs. Jacobs by a 14-year-old, that's okay. We've got another question up here. Thank you. Um, as uh, I find middle age retreating further and further into the past, um, I'm uh, 
wondering to myself what what all that what all of that was about. Um, I'm wondering, in fact, this is, uh, follows the last question and uh, a re response to it. I think uh, it's a little bit redundant, actually. It may have been treated, but. Um, it uh, strikes me that, to a large extent, it's a cultural artefact that's imposed on us, um, coming out of the way that <coughs> we're expected to uh, have careers and at a certain stage in life uh, come to the conclusion, this is about as far as I'm going to go, and uh, that may be just depressing or it may be dreadful. Um, uh, it's not very long ago that we invented the notion of being a teenager. Um, not very long ago, uh, people simply left school, if they even went to school, and went straight to work. Um, they were uh, um, expected to be um, little adults. Um, and I wonder whether <laughs> um, we're looking too closely at this. Um, at, uh, there are certain objective facts about uh, um, early teenager uh, being uh, puberty. There are the one objective fact about um, being middle-aged is, is uh, menopause in women. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, it's just a, a continuation, a growth, a spectrum, um, and it's very, very difficult to see um, <laughs> where it begins and ends. Well, maybe it's a construct that we put around things to stop ourselves from being old. I think, look, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the cultural definitions, uh, but I think uh, cultural, culture is our reality. Um, we live in the culture and therefore just because it's a social construction doesn't mean it doesn't have real effects on people. And I think that's a, an important aspect to acknowledge. Um, I think there's, there's some things we do know just looking at statistics in Australia. You know, we, we talked about the miseries of uh, middle age in the title. Well, we do know that the highest rates of anxiety and the highest rates of depression if you, over a 12 month period occur in this group of people from sort of 35 to 55. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of unhappiness, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress going on in people's lives. So I think, yes, it's true, it's a social construction, but it has real effects. So I think it's important to look at what, what those effects are and try and understand the processes that might be involved that affect uh, individuals differently. We're obviously not all the same, but there, I think there are major themes that do emerge uh, in this period of life just because of the kind of general um, changes that are taking place for us, both physical and social. I think one of the important uh, things that Chris mentioned earlier, but um, I think I'll highlight it a bit, is mortality. Um, when we reach middle age, we start to understand a couple of things. When we're a teenager, we're pretty immortal. As we move into middle age, we start to understand death better. Both the fact that we're not going to live forever, but it's around middle age, and it's a middle age we call a big, it's really a big age span, but in middle age, we start to understand that our relation, people we have relationships with, are dying, and they do. Our uh, grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, eventually our own parents, uh, our, if, you know, if, if things don't work out well, sadly, our own partners, even our own children can die in this period uh, of our life. And uh, when we're younger, we don't think about that so much. Our own health, of course, raises this issue even further. Like every time I wake up in the morning, I'm kind of, I feel middle-aged. After a while, I warm up a bit and I don't think about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's what generally happens to us. So I think, yes, it is a social construction, but some important things happen to us. We understand the world in a slightly different way, and that affects the rest of our relationships. And I think it's very important to see it, that it is about a network of relationships. Our construction of middle age uh, is in a social context where we're living with people and we're also in what people call a convoy, a convoy of peers going through this period. And one of the things I've noticed in terms of mortality 
is that when I listen to, to triple six in the morning, what I often hear is that yet another person I remember from my teenage years, some singer, rock musician, actor, yet another one has died. And I start to see my own life in that context of passing in permanence. I think that's a really important theme um, to consider. Yes, Sorry, sure. can I just pick up on that? Because I, I agree it is really important. And I think um, well, a lot of the developmental research is now focusing on this notion of future time perspective and, and the growing uh, salience of limits to future time as people get older. And one of the areas that's, that's been, that, that has been linked to is people's <coughs> emotional well-being in the period that we might refer to as uh, late midlife or, or young old Adulthood is another word for it, but it's that sort of um, that time of, uh, say, around between age, ages 60 and 70. And uh, people in that age group actually have really high levels of well-being, um, much higher than younger people, despite the beginning of ageing-related losses. And one of the major explanations for that is that as people start to perceive their time as becoming more limited, they detach themselves from future-orientated goals about their career in their life and what they want to achieve, and they focus much more on emotional meaning in the present mm -hmm. and on establishing positive, close social relationships. And I think that's probably another feature of that period of life that can actually um, have uh, significant benefits mm -hmm. for emotional well-being. Uh, being in the now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, we'll go to another question in a moment, but I did want to bring Susie Kesey in here on the question of employment, because that's one of the things that can have a profound relationship to wellbeing at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. When we look at em uh, employment and wellbeing at an overall general level, we know that employment it's, is associated with better physical and mental health. But when you start to look at that relationship more closely, you realise that the nature of work itself can be associated with adverse health risks. And in middle age as well, I think it's really important to consider that role of work, given that it is such an important role, and um, and both and that the fact that both men and women have a strong psychological attachment to work. So it's not just we're not just looking at the health risks. Um, uh, sort of in addition to what Donna said, that accumulated health risks in terms of cardiovascular risk, um, diabetes, musculoskeletal injury, mental health risks in terms of depression and anxiety and substance use, um, health, um, health behaviour risks such as um, smoking, alcohol use, um, diet and whatnot. But we're also needing to take into consideration that the meaning of work itself has an impact on uh, emotional well-being. So for men, uh, for example, uh, one of the strongest um, findings is that a job characterised by high demands and low control is associated with the biggest um, disease risk. And what we notice here is that that relationship isn't as strong for women. So one possible way of looking at that is, uh, what is the meaning of work for men? Is it that core social role? Is it that breadwinner role? So I think, again, that psychological meaning of work um, is important to consider in our health as well. I'm, I'm interested in what you make of the difference between men and women because we've seen women's career paths change dramatically in the last few decades and the meaning of work for women has increased significantly. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're seeing now is that women are accelerating their careers in their 40s and 50s and they make up about close to 50% of the <coughs> workforce. So this is up about by a third since the 1970s. So what we're seeing is a generational shift and at a psychological level for women, what this means is their sense of purpose and identity is uh, now being defined beyond that caregiving role to work. So I think in terms of self-esteem and self-worth, that's a really good thing that's... Um, happening for us. So. Well, in a society where women were defined by the reproductive purpose, mm. once that reproductive purpose finished, really you were just waiting, weren't you? Yes, yes Life went on. I think we've got another question up here somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> I uh, want to focus on perhaps some of the miseries rather than uh, perhaps the myths as, <coughs> as well. Um, I think one myth, not necessarily middle age, perhaps a little earlier, uh, is that of childbirth, where women all seem to be uh, observationally uh, very surprised that it could really hurt that much. Um, the thing I want to focus on is uh, memory loss, um, which perhaps that uh, defines itself outside middle age, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a good boundary. 
But, uh, you know, why is it that we're not told just how bad this can be? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, how absolutely debilitating it is. Does anyone remember the answer to that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our, Professor Byrne has a thought. <laughs> Don or Christine, do you say how bad childbirth is or how bad memory loss is? <laughs> I'll, I'll cover memory, but I know nothing about childbirth. <laughs> Childbirth is pain, and, and actually we don't hold memories of pain very well. Is that the, one of the reasons that we forget about it is actually because it's that health pain. Memory loss is, oh, that's a terrible thing. You talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one thing is very, very obvious from a lot of evidence that we have, and I think Tim could probably talk about this as well, but uh, that uh, after um, probably a relatively young age, maybe 50 or thereabouts, uh, memory starts to decline. Our capacity to retain things and store things uh, in short term starts to, to decline. And uh, it's a very individual specific thing, but um, uh, I think it's evident in, in most of us. Uh, unfortunately, in some of us, it's evident to a far greater extent. Uh, and uh, that's one of the features that defines things like early onset dementia and, and so on. Uh, that uh, we, we see people around us um, just not remembering uh, things that were commonplace or things that happened a minute ago or uh, faces that were familiar to them. And um, so we're looking at a, at a, a dimension of, of memory loss here. Uh, it's, it's not something that's uh, in, in any sense uh, uniform or, or standard. You know, a long time ago, I was at a, at a conference um, and a pathologist gave... Uh, uh, a, a, a talk on Alzheimer's disease, and um, he, he said uh, that we should all reflect on the on the three things that are that are good about having Alzheimer's disease. Uh, one is that you can hide your own Easter eggs, <laughs> and uh, the other is that you make new friends every day, and the third is that you can hide your own Easter eggs. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And unfortunately, it can sometimes get to, to that point. But um, one, of the, one of the really good things about uh, psychology is that if there's a problem, you know, we can think of ways of fixing it. And uh, if we're looking at, at sort of subclinical or quasi-clinical memory loss, there are all sorts of things that we can do. Little aid memoirs to, to, um, to make sure that we, we don't forget things. I forget things uh, a lot. The way I rationalise it is information overload. Uh, you know, I say that I've got so much coming in that, of course, I can't. But, you know, there is, there is one obvious explanation for it, and that is that in line with how old I am, uh, there's a level of cognitive decline. It's an inevitability. Uh, it, it comes with the territory. Uh, and, um, you know, we can try to, to think of ways and means of, uh, of helping ourselves along with that. Uh, but uh, uh, so far as I know, there's no enormous uh, biomedical breakthrough which is going to... Um, to get us out of that hassle. But I think, Tim, you've probably got more information on, on the, uh, the natural history of memory loss over the lifespan. I can, I can add a little bit to that. And, and one, one point is that it's not all bad news because while it is true that um, our ability to remember things on a short-term basis and our ability to process information does tend to decline with age, our store of accumulated knowledge just keeps growing. And, so in, in that period of midlife, people really do develop high levels of expertise in the fields that uh, they specialise in, and they can use that high level of knowledge often to compensate for these um, perhaps gradual declines in their ability to, uh, to use the mechanic aspects of their cognition. So that's one point. But in terms of uh, another interesting recent finding from some research we've done at, uh, at the Centre for Mental Health Research lately is that... Um, uh, Professor David Bunce, a visiting person from the, the UK, has uh, looked at, at brain scans of people in midlife and found that um, white matter lesions, which are associated with Alzheimer's disease, um, are more evident in people in midlife who do poorer on cognitive tests than among people who do better on cognitive tests. And, and this is potentially quite a... Um, a breakthrough in terms of flagging opportunities for screening for dementia during midlife. So um, as these techniques continue to become uh, developed, 
we might become better at actually identifying people at risk for developing uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia and then maybe incorporate interventions in those groups at an earlier time in life that could help to delay the onset of uh, both normal cognitive decline and um, disease like Alzheimer's and disease. And you're making a distinction there between dementia and Alzheimer's disease and normal cognitive decline. Yeah. That, yeah. that definition can be made clearly. I just wanted to, I, I, I was reading today, I saw you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, have turned the panel to me, but I also want to, there's the, there's a, the kind of, <laughs> there's um, the kind of pathological kind of disease progression that, of Alzheimer's disease that is, is quite severe ultimately. But I think that, as I understand it, that there, there's actually some evidence now that people who kind of can, almost like doing mental exercises. If you kind of, if you're, if you kind of keep your mind active, and that could be a variety of things, as I understand it, even potentially just doing word, word, uh, Puzzles. Puzzles. yeah, that one, <laughs> <laughs> uh, crosswords and so on. It tells you what I've been doing at work lately, hasn't it? So, uh, but uh, um, then this is going to kind of assist, or at least begin to buffer against any natural. Um, decline that may occur, and so I think that I, don't, I, don't, I think that while that the, uh, Alzheimer's is is for for many of us a reality that we will uh, face or confront, uh, I think that this idea that we're all kind of destined to have this you know considerable memory loss, uh, and 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 that's it, give up, uh, is I'm not persuaded that it's true. There's the heuristic little rules of thumb that Don was talking about that help us get by, but I also think that if we kind of actively kind of keep mentally active in a variety of ways, then that can help buffer it as well. And so some, you know, we might retire and think, yeah, that's it, don't have to think anymore. But maybe we need to kind of, kind of keep up the, the, the mental exercise as well as the physical exercise. My husband has an uncle who is a retired judge and has gone back to learning classical Greek at 94. <laughs> <laughs> and he is sharp as a tack, absolutely. Can I make a comment? And I have lots of people who come to me in their 50s and say, I can't remember things, I'm forgetting people's, my, my short term memory is going. I'm really worried that I have Alzheimer's. And, um, if you look at what the way they're working and the way that they're thinking, actually, this doesn't look like Alzheimer's at all. It looks like somebody who is actually thinking and doing the kind of synthesising talk uh, uh, work that we've been talking about really, really well. So actually, they are very good deep thinkers, but they have lost some of their short-term memory. Now that always leaps into people's heads. You know, whenever you forget where the keys are, you think, "Oh, that's it. I'm going to get Alzheimer's." <laughs> You've forgotten that you've actually put together a very complicated puzzle or you've sorted or, or a, a work, you've solved a very complicated solution at work because you've been using other elements of your, your cognition. But what you've noticed is that you've forgotten where the keys are or you've left the gas on and therefore you must be getting Alzheimer's. So there are signal things we pay attention to which we think mean decline when we're not actually picking up the other areas where we're actually thinking very, very well. I just wanted to, to kind of bring together a couple of points. One is the this, uh, this idea of um, this cultural difference in the way we look at age, um, uh, I think there has been a cultural shift now. So that in the workplace, for example, there's this very anti-seniority kind of approach. Uh, now that kind of taken to an extreme means that, well, in fact, older people are not valued really at all. Uh, in, and if you look at the kind of evidence about that, well, what does that mean in the workplace? Well. One thing, it means that your store of knowledge is disappearing from, from a corporate culture. Because older people who have been in there and who, who know the systems and have learned over time, well, that corporate knowledge disappears out of a system. So people have to keep reinventing the wheel all the time. The other one is this kind of notion of like senility, this kind of prejudice against um, older people, even middle-aged people like me, can be seen by younger people as, well, they're kind of just less capable uh, uh, because you know they can't think as fast or do something as quickly, and that's prized more. I think if you look, the, the paradox to me is that as a nation we're getting older, but there seems to be an increasing age stereotype or prejudice that is actually occurring. If you're over forty, it's like you're over the hill, uh, and I think there. Are, but there are many counterexamples, of course, of people who who try and start new careers. Sometimes it works out. For Kevin Rudd, it didn't kind of work out quite so well. <laughs> but there are uh, other people who are quite successful at it. 
who can change mid-career and, and start off again. But for many others, they're not in that position. And I think, um, I think this, this kind of notion that when you get that age, it becomes very hard to get a job, to get another job, if you are in fact retrenched, because you're seen as, well, you're over the hill and maybe you can't think as fast and you're a bit senile. So that's an interesting paradox to me. As a nation, as we get older, I just see more evidence of kind of age prejudice in, to some extent. Got a question over here? Um, oh, sorry, the microphone's up there. I'll go to you in a moment. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm Marian Kiakovic. I'm middle-aged and proud of it. <laughs> I've been hearing for the last uh, 50 minutes nothing but gloom and doom about middle age. So could, could, could you as panellists tell me the benefits there is about being middle-aged? Because <laughs> there's more of us than have ever been before in history. And uh, I think most of us probably like it. Um, but I'd like to hear the benefits of middle age. Thank you. <laughs> uh, look, I think there are some really major benefits if we open our eyes to them. One of the major things, we talked about mortality before, but another major thing is actually caring when we reach middle age. We start to kind of go beyond ourselves and start to care for other people. When we have children, when we have our intimate relationships, and to an extent, I think we become a little self-centred, less self-centred. We start to reach out and actually think about other people. I think the other thing that comes through, it's a kind of classical theme in, in psychology for this age group, is, is, is creativity and generativity. At this age, we're thinking about, well, well, what can I contribute to the world? It's not just about my career, but it's, I have a family. I have responsibilities to those other people. And what is the legacy I'm going to leave behind? Um, when, when, when they read out my obituary, what are they going to say about me? Start to become the issue. So I think that can be an amazing force for positivity. People can see that as an opportunity to make uh, significant contributions. And I think in middle age, that's where many significant contributions are made to our society, to each other in our community, uh, and in terms of a kind of general creativeness and, and move forward. And, and look, I, th I think that for many of us being middle-aged, I certainly feel like this myself, there's a great sense of power. You feel, I know my capacity and I am fully able to achieve my goals. And that's a sense that I think very few people have really genuinely in perhaps their early 20s. And I, I, who else would like to comment on that? The, Don, the good things about middle age. The good, uh, there, there are lots of good things about middle age. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased you raised it because when we first started talking about this forum and, and about a title, we were going to talk of it as um, middle age, uh, misery or magnificence. Uh, and uh, I'm a little bit sorry that the magnificent bit got lost because uh, you know I think there are some magnificent things about middle age. Uh, the, the physical decline is, is something that, um, although we can use all sorts of things, uh, including the good services of Christine and her colleagues to counteract, we, we can't necessarily stop it. But what are the good things about middle age? There's, there's wisdom, accumulative knowledge. There's a, a, a capacity that you don't see in the young because they want to act rapidly, quickly, they want to dive in and, and, and do things without thinking. People of my age, I think, I hope, will step back a bit and say, now hang on, let's, let's just think about all of this in, in terms of the context, in terms of the history, in terms of my cumulative experience. What should we do? And, you know, I guess I'd put my head on the block and say that uh, decisions under those kinds of circumstances are often better in the long run than the, the impulse-driven decisions that, that young people uh, are, are prone to make. <coughs> So this whole collection of knowledge, of wisdom, of experience, and the capacity to apply that to complex life situations in such a way that other people I don't think can, is one of the real benefits to me of middle age. Okay, great. Um, question down here. Well, this sort of, I think, um, carries on from your point. Uh, historically, I don't think middle age, and I don't think getting older, now, this is kind of like a question for you guys because I'm not sure whether I'm right, but I think there was always a real pride in becoming an adult, like reaching adulthood and then, uh, you know, going on to, 
you know, reaching um, success and being, uh, being a, an important member of society, which was always someone old and your parents and whatever. And then somewhere probably around the 60s, and they say, you know, that the 60s, you either love it or you hate it, um, it all became about youth. And it all became a very big focus on youth and getting into, you know, no one even wanted to reach adulthood. And, and I now see this as one of the biggest dilemmas that we face. And I'm, one of the reasons for having a, a forum like this or going in this direction was to really think, do we need to redefine middle age and adulthood and adopting responsibility? You know, recognising that it is this group of adults in our society who, who largely become the establishment, as much as that's a, you know, sort of term from the, from the 60s, but that's the thing it is for me. You are the establishment. All of a sudden, there's no one else to blame. You're the senior person. You run the thing. It's, it's you. And yet, I almost get the feeling there's a real reluctance in society to, to, to be that. And I, I, I guess I'm just um, interested in your views. I also wonder whether the boomers, because they make up such a huge percentage of the population, are likely to change this and, uh, and, and leap into the middle age um, and, and, and change that attitude about youth and hopefully bring you know, adulthood back into um, fashion, you know, that it's fashionable again to be, a, to be an adult. Michael, I might put that to you, this idea of being willing to take on the identity of an adult, being willing to own that. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I think there's a completely legitimate process and a completely legitimate question, and I think that, but I, 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 I think it's a collective process that we have to engage in, that you're talking about. It's, it's uh, all well for me to say, well, I'm an adult, and I expect you to treat me like one, or whatever, give me the respect, and, and it, that it's, it's, it just, it's not going to happen if it's just me. It's not just an individual process. And so this is a, this, these, these shifts in what it means to be a valued person, what it means to be a valued member of society, has to be a collective shift. And, and these processes uh, are difficult. Uh, how difficult is it to say, hey, um, women should be valued in society? How difficult is it to, to say, hey, in, Indigenous Australians should be valued in society? How difficult is it to say, hey, people who are 50 should be valued in society? Now, I'm not saying that people who are 50 are discriminated against like the other groups I was just mentioning. Okay, so, but the point is that these are societal shifts and they are difficult. And they, they involve collective action, collective change, uh, collective will um, to, to bring about. But there's no reason why we, but having said that, and the positive thing is, there's no reason why we can't. Let's, you know, seize the day. Let's do it. Let's take it. Let's take it to the streets. You know, let's, let's be out there and reclaiming this for ourselves. Let's have a banner, reclaiming mid -lake. <laughs> no, there's, there's no reason. Because, I mean, this view that, that, that Ross was saying as well, that, oh, you know, you know, old folk, it takes so long to think about things you can't make. Well, it's not that I, it's not, I, I'm not persuaded that it takes me longer biologically, necessarily, to make my decision. It's that I'm wiser. It's that I'm actually thinking about it. I'm actually going about reflecting on all the, co the consequences. I'm taking responsibility. I am being an adult. I am being responsible. And sometimes that takes a few more minutes <laughs> for me to make my mind up. And it doesn't mean I'm only fe feeble. It means I'm reflecting and being responsible. And, and that should be recognised and rewarded. Mm. Uh, Christine, you wanted to come in? Uh, I think... I think I'm sorry if we've been negative about middle age because I actually think this is this is the vigorous time of life and society rests upon its middle age. We are the people who look after the young, we are the people who look after our elders, we are the people that drive society forward. This is the time. One of the problems is ourselves though. We, you know, we, our reluctance to actually say, I am this age. I am our, our fight for youth. You know, every time we go and Botox ourselves or we try to 
hide the, the lines that life gave us that indicate the wisdom that we may have. Every time we, we buy into that belief that we, we, we have to present ourselves in a way that uh, um, belies the age that we have, then, then we are also um, stepping away from that idea that middle age is a time of, of vigour. And, and I think the, 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 the enormous sales job that the plastic surgery industry has done for women has been really dangerous, particularly for women, in that it has really reinforced that notion that you, you can't age well, that you have to age by hiding the signs of your biological age. But if we, if we look at those stereotypes about ageing, and I mentioned at the beginning the one of the man, the sports car, the 20-year-old, there's a sense that that's the last run at freedom. That, that's not necessarily wholly a stereotype. We see that pattern repeated over and over again, where people grasp for the last time at, at the signs of being young, the outward appearance of being yeah, young. Yeah, but, but if you think about when you were young, that really wasn't a time of enormous freedom, was it? It no, was a time of self-doubt. And <laughs> Don, you <laughs> and might have a thought on that? Yeah, look, a, a, a couple of points. I mean, one of the points I made right at the very beginning was that age is a state of mind, or at least it partly is, and, and I'm going to hold to that because I think in, in large part we define ourselves as who we are. And if we define ourselves as old and decrepit, even if we're 30, that's what we're going to be. And if we're 65 or 70 and we define ourselves as relatively young and vigorous, that's what we're going to be. So I think we've all got to, to, uh, to be very aware that we will frequently tell ourselves what we, we are, we're going to be. And then if, if we don't find that a happy state to be in, we've got to alter our own cognitions and tell ourselves that it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we really are doing damn well mm -hmm. at 65 or 70 or, or whatever. I think the other real problem, unfortunately, uh, is that of, of social stereotypes. Uh, you know, we often hear uh, organisations doing age profiles of their workforce. Why? I don't understand that. You know, why would they want to know uh, what the, the age profile is? What relevance does, does that have, except, uh, you know, in terms of, of um, calculations of insurance payouts or, or whatever? Uh, and if they stop focusing so much on, on age profiles and look more on experience profiles or productivity profiles or contribution profiles or whatever you wanted to call it, then I think that a whole lot of this stereotype would be, uh, would be broken down. Uh, and, and that seems to me to be uh, a destructive thing in a way that uh, groups and organisations and uh, institutions and, and so on uh, do. Um, I mean, in, in terms of, uh, of, of the magnificence of middle age, I think that, you know, quite frankly, it is or it can be a, a, a magnificent period. But we've got to work on making it so uh, for us. And uh, I think if, if, uh, if we give up, and we accept the social stereotypes, uh, then uh, then we're lost. Uh, so I think that you know we middle-aged people have to to make those decisions for ourselves, but then um, be very vocal about uh, those decisions. You you talk about the uh, you know the, the sort of symptoms of midlife crisis and going out and buying a uh, a, a, a fancy car and so on. Some of you may have seen a picture of me in the Canberra Times this morning next to my new Alfa Romeo. Uh, <laughs> That is not a middle-aged crisis, and, and as, uh, as it said, uh, and as I made sure the, the nice young lady who interviewed me yesterday said, my wife told me I had to go out and buy an Alfa Romeo. It wasn't me who said I have to go out and... But seriously, I think that a lot of what we would view, again in a stereotypic way, as a midlife crisis, is actually relatively ordinary people putting up their hands and saying, recognise me. Don't reject me. Don't tell me because I'm over 55 that I'm also over the hill, I'm of no use, I can't contribute to society. Now, they're doing it sometimes in rather bizarre and flamboyant and occasionally destructive ways. But in, in a sense, I would see that almost as a, as a cry for help, a cry for recognition, a way of saying, don't discard me. Don't put me on the trash heap just because I'm 55, 60, 65. They're doing it in interesting ways, but nonetheless, you know, I think it's a real statement and I think we have to recognise it, not so much as a, as a grasping for teenage dreams, because as a number of people have pointed out, you know, we didn't have those dreams necessarily as teenagers, and if we did, they wouldn't have been realisable. But I think it's a statement 
of, of, of the need for identity, the need for acceptance, the need for recognition. Mm. Uh, and I think we as society need to, to recognise that and acknowledge it. I, I do want to talk in a moment about um, the transitions that happen in relationships and marriages in particular, but I think we've got another question up the back here. Yeah. Yes, uh, just two quick points. There was a discussion earlier about mortality, reflecting on mortality in middle age, and there was an example given of rock stars. Isn't there a flip side to that? Uh, I'm thinking of the longevity of people like the Rolling Stones and uh, Leonard Cohen still doing three-hour concerts, Blondie yeah. touring. So it makes me think about longevity rather than mortality. Uh, but my question is about whether anyone on the panel thinks that there is a, is a tendency to medicalise and even pathologise the ageing process. If you pop a few pills, HRT, Viagra, a whole suite of antidepressants, cosmetics, uh, that could stave off fix, cure, or slow down the ageing process. Is anyone concerned about that? Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple of things I'd say about that. Yeah, I think there, there, there is this kind of, um, the, you know, you've got to remember that, that medicine is, can be tremendously beneficial and many of those medications you spoke about have been a boon to people uh, and assisted people greatly. But they're also the products of money-making multinational corporations who are interested in, in the whole process. And we know now that those companies are much more interested in creating drugs for so-called chronic diseases, because that means if it's a chronic disease, you will have to keep taking that drug for 20, 30 years. And so you'll make a lot of money out of that, uh, in, that in that sense. So I think it's true. I think it's a balance that, that goes on. There, is, there are forces that, that kind of drive that process. But often they are in response to real issues. Um, diabetes is a, is a kind of classic example. Um, uh, hypertension, heart disease are actually all real things that people need assistance for and people's quality of life have been improved. Uh, but your general point I would agree with that, that you know, we cast this negative life over get, uh, light over getting older and see, uh, tend to see these changes as somehow pathological rather than normal ageing, partly because I think we have a concept, uh, a problem with the whole concept of ageing uh, because of kind of a youth culture that ageing equals bad and therefore it must be a disease kind of thing that's happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, you yeah, know, that's how I'd respond to that. And if Keith Richards represents ageing well, um, <laughs> I think you're all doing marvellously. <laughs> um, I, I did want to talk about these transitions in relationships because it strikes me that, that middle age is often a time when marriages, when partnerships dissolve and it seems to me that perhaps there are long-running partnerships that have a certain function. We reach this transition point and then <coughs> sometimes they end and there's that concept of trading in the old partner for a new model and I, I wondered what the panel's response to that kind of transition. Tim, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, it, it relates to some specific work that we've been doing lately where we've looked at um, the level of interrelations between couples um, in terms of their mental health. And, and what we found was that partners who've been together for first-time partners who got together very early in life and are still together in older adulthood or, or late midlife um, were very closely intertwined in terms of their uh, mental health. So if one partner tended to have very good mental health and the other partner was more likely to and, and vice versa. Um, however, when we compared that group to a group of people of a similar age where at least one of the two members of the couple had been in a previous partnered relationship, we found that there was actually very little um, interrelation between the couples who'd been previously partnered. Now that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it just shows that the two groups are very different. And, it's interesting as we think about the implications of um, the ageing baby boomers and the fact that um, repartnering is more common in that age group, that the spousal uh, dyad may become a less central context for emotional well-being um, at the population uh, uh, level into the future. I, I think you're saying there that the husband and wife team might not be the core of society. Is that what you mean by the, the, the core of happiness? The matrimonial dyad? Or yeah, 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 <laughs> that's, um, just, that's 
a good interpretation. Okay. <laughs> Christine Phillips, to you on that, one of the changes that happens in menopause is that the so-called caring hormones disappear. And, you know, the, the impetus that women have for nurturing as, as a really primary role is lessened, and I wonder whether that also has an impact on relationships and a bid for freedom, perhaps, on the part of some middle-aged women. I don't know how much of that is biological. <laughs> uh, and there are, I mean, there is a school of thought that says as oestrogen goes, you lose your your nurturing, your sense that you need to nurture the partner in your life. I don't know how much of that actually is biological and how much of that is just a, a transition that people have. It is certainly true, I think, that... Um, I mean, I've had women come to me and say, I really don't care what other people think about me anymore. What a liberation. <laughs> <laughs> what a fantastic thing to happen. And I think that's been hormonally mediated. Maybe it is but it's certainly a, a, a liberation. We tend to, I agree with you up the back, we really tend to pathologise menopause, which in times gone by, before the era of contraception, that was a huge liberation for women. Women would greet <coughs> menopause as the time when they would stop worrying about unwanted pregnancies. Um, so we tend to pathologise it very much now. But the nurturing element is, is, is a tricky one. I know that I'm extending your question a bit because Women in, middle, women in in middle age actually find themselves caring up as yeah. well as caring down. And so not only are they caring, setting aside the partner, they are also, the, the children, they are also, particularly women, but it's by no means limited to them, are also caring for their, their elders. And once upon a time that didn't happen so much because elders didn't live for such a long period and so vigorously. So you, many women, I mean people in the audience will be familiar with that phenomenon of actually finding that your <coughs> parents are frail and that you have to re-evaluate that relationship with, you with them and care for them and that is a, it's one of the great challenges, one of the great getters of wisdom, one of the great triggers of the wisdom that you get in middle age I think, but also one of the great challenges of it. And I guess with the delay in childbearing for many women, with, with that generation of women who have not had babies until the very late 30s, yes. lots of people aren't going to be finished parenting until they're 60. They're be parenting very young and then parenting up as well. Yeah, yes. and, and with parents by that stage who are perhaps well into their 80s. Yeah. Um, Don, I wanted to put to you something I know you've looked at. Sexual capacity can, can also change and that can also lead to all sorts of problems in, in long-running partnerships and there's a, a really big <coughs> potential impact there, isn't there? I hadn't realised I'd looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right. I mean, sexual capacities change, sexual desires change, uh, sexual performance change. Somebody mentioned a little while ago Viagra. Um, and uh, obviously in, in middle-aged men, for a whole range of reasons, erectile impotence is a real problem. And a problem which impacts enormously onto their self-image, their self-esteem, uh, and so on. I think Christine also touched on something a little while ago um, uh, in, in which um, uh, the loss of fertility may mean a, a sexual liberation for some women because they can now engage in, or could then, engage in sexual behaviours without risk. Uh, whether or not this, um, I guess, impacts over into actual social and, and interpersonal behaviours, I don't know. I mean, Ross, Ross may well know the answer to this, but uh, you know, are middle-aged people more promiscuous than... Uh, <laughs> Than, than adolescence, I don't think so, but um, but it, it, it may be the case. Perhaps well, I, they're just better at, at hiding their activities. Ross, why is smart? Might be why they're smarter at doing it. It's true, but uh, a middle age is the peak period for divorce. Yes, we know around the mid 40s that's when most people get divorced. But it's also on the flip side, it's also the peak period of remarriage as well. So families do restructure. I think that's important to recognise that. In terms of the infidelity thing, I think, well, it, it, it's kind of a combination of factors. And I find it interesting the rise of this idea of the cougar. In the, oh, you know, yes. it's, it's kind of a, it's a kind of predatory, <laughs> middle-aged <laughs> female uh, who, who becomes divorced and then there's after all these young men. Now, um, I, don't, I don't really understand why, uh, to some extent, some people see that as more acceptable than the predatory male doing this similar kind of thing. Uh, but somehow that's also been uh, uh, arising in culture. I think there are kind of differences we know about men's performance. You know, peak performance sexually for men is quite a young age and then, you know, tends to, to drop off. But there is this thing about women being, you know, more sexually kind of 
uh, at their maturity at a much older age. Now, I'm not an expert on those kind of points, but um, that's, what, uh, that's what we're told. Um, I don't know, what do the other panellists think? Is that kind well, of I, I would speculate that perhaps part, partly that's because of that greater level of confidence that women have about themselves and their bodies. Yeah, Just although I think, I think I mean, that issue about young men being at their peak in sexual performance, that's purely around erectile function. Sex oh. is more than erectile function. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that a 17-year-old has to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more. <laughs> uh, uh, so th I, I would think that... that uh, I would th although if, if that's all you were judging it on, yes, that you would peak you're quite young, but most men, of course, actually become more proficient and more... Uh, and the unit between themselves and their partner becomes more involved and sexual pleasure increases as people age. Um, I'll leave aside this issue of... of, of uh, uh, Viagra, I think, has actually been quite liberating. Viagra has probably been quite a liberating medication, it seems to me, although it has, again, returned the idea of sexual performance to erectile function. That's the thing that Viagra did. It did reconfigure sex as erectile function. Now, that erectile function is important for sex, but it's by no means the only thing that's needed, and you can have very satisfactory sex without it without a very strong erection. Mm. I think we've got a question up here. Yeah. Yes, Jennifer, if, if I can pick up on your introductory remarks, you said uh, that a lot of people had uh, phoned in and said just because they're registering here, that didn't mean they were middle-aged. Can I assure you that I registered here in the hope that I was still middle-aged? <laughs> uh, being 66, Tim has assured me that I'm over the limit. So um, can I, as a... a, a uh, snuck in under false pretenses candidate, uh, ask really what sources of information are there for the elderly or, or the growing older people uh, as to what is going to happen? I mean, sure, I know I'm going to die. Um, I know that Alzheimer's is a, a risk, prostate cancer is a risk, other cancers are a risk, heart disease. But <laughs> what sorts of information is there out there that, that would um, enable me to better direct my life. Um, and before I give anyone a chance to answer that, I suspect Christine Phillips is probably the best one, could I just comment, one of the speakers said that there was a reluctance to hire people in their 50s because of physical or mental failings or, or that. I'd strongly refute that. Um, I would suggest that the main reason is that this is a person who's mature, who has plenty of knowledge, plenty of experience, and may well be a threat to the person who's th th thinking about hiring him. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and now, who would like to take on that question about resources, Christine? Well, this, this is Movember. <laughs> Movember is the month that actually does talk about some elements of ageing well for men, particularly uh, about uh, mental health. So. Um, uh, many of the Beyond Blue resources I think are actually very good for middle-aged men who are struggling with word, to f even find the words about what is not right with them. Some of those resources are really useful. In terms of physical health, um, uh, um, uh, it, it's pretty simple. It's around eating well, <laughs> enjoying your food, eating more slowly, uh, trying not to have a lot of fat, uh, but not demonising fat either. Exercise, really important. It's probably the thing we do least well, exercise. Um, and finding the thing that you're passionate about and doing it. I mean, that setting aside pathologising it, I think they're the real things that will help you to age well. Uh, I would that was really what was asked. Suggest that there, there is a, um, I'm not sure how good it is because I haven't spent a lot of time looking at it, but I know that there is a, a, um, uh, a government website that has <coughs> links to a lot of different sources of information for older Australians. Um, uh, I think it's through the Department of Health and Ageing, and they probably have a link to it if, um, if it's not actually administered by them. Um, and then I suppose there are groups. Um, like 
I'm not sure there's a one-stop shop, but I know groups like Alzheimer's Australia, for example, have very active education programs. They had a Mind Your Mind um, initiative about how to promote healthy lifestyles to help with the, um, the delay of uh, cognitive decline. So there are, there are a couple of possibilities. Can I, can I just add to that? Christine is probably too modest to say this, but surely the Senior most... GP. The, the most <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The most valuable resource yeah. is a good, experienced, middle-aged GP. <laughs> I think we had a, a question here. So. Yes, I do. Um, I'll just get the microphone to you. Um, I'd just like someone to speak to the psychological aspect, because people don't come to middle age with a psychological clean slate. And when you're younger, obviously, you have your defences are stronger to keep any sort of emotional baggage, if I could use that awful word, at bay. And that seems to dilute as you get older. And sometimes you can be... It's um, almost like a domino effect, that all the unresolved things of your earlier life, suddenly the floodgates are open because you have no more resistance to, to, to repressing them. And obviously that would impact on, uh, on middle age, how you view... How, how it impacts on relationships, work, even how you feel about yourself. In fact, particularly how you feel about yourself. I'm just wondering if someone could address, or lots of you could address that, those sorts of issues. Uh, Michael, perhaps on the, on the question of, of the intact self-image. I think that for, uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't know the data fully about that, and I'm, but I have to say I'm not fully persuaded that that's a necessity that that's gonna happen, okay? I can imagine that it happens to people, I'm sure it happens to, to people. I don't think that it has to happen. And I think that, and I don't think it has to happen, and when those kind of floodgates open, I don't think it has to happen in middle age. If it happens, it could happen older, it could happen younger. That there are things that you know, because it depends on what those experiences have been in your life and what resources, what so social support you've got, uh, and so on, and are gonna help you manage, where, where you are, all these things are gonna help you manage through your, through your life. Uh, and the variety of different kinds of identities that we have. I mean, there is some evidence uh, from a variety of different pers uh, kind of approaches to the question that kind of the more, and I don't want to use this in a path, this is not a pathological sense, so, so don't, don't, don't misunderstand it. The more identities that we have, and I don't mean that kind of like multiple personalities kind of as a stereotype. Uh, I mean, the more kind of, oh, here, I am Michael, I am male, I am, American, I am a psychologist. I, okay, so these are my identities. And the more of these things that I can draw on, we're actually finding now that, that people are actually having uh, a greater kind of um, ability to cope with stressful situations and so on. And so part of it is going to be not just who you are as a unique core individual with nothing else, but almost the, the, the whole range of things that you can draw on to support yourself and so on. So at all these different identities. No, so it's not that we just need one. In fact, I would say we need lots of different kinds of identities that would help support but us. Some of those identities eventually drop away, like seeing, viewing yourself as like a Like young. Person. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> that, so yes. that's right. And so we move into new ones. Um, and so now we move in from young to middle age. And this gets back to my consistent argument that what we need is a, is a, is a construction and understanding, collective understanding that, that middle age and old is good. And if we move, otherwise what we're doing is we're moving into a new group, a new identity that everybody told, tells us, in fact we may have believed when we were younger, is the bad one, okay? And oh my goodness, all of a sudden I'm in the bad group. Now I feel bad and there's no way out, okay? and. That is collectively pathologizing age, like, and we shouldn't be doing that. We should be collectively either celebrating it and saying, you know, you have wisdom, and you are an elder, or, or just saying, hey, you are. This is life, and this is where we are. And so we're not moving from the good group to the bad group. We're just moving on. Just so people. One, sorry, one size doesn't fit all. And you can have so many identities that you can hide behind, but when they start to crumble, maybe... You no, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't call them hiding I behind. I know you don't agree. I'm just wondering if mm. someone else would, mm. might just understand what I'm asking and respond to it. Well, maybe middle age might be a time to heal. If you are in that reflective um, stage in your life, it might be an opportunity 
um, to heal your relationship with others, relationship with self. So really focusing now on yourself and, and personal growth in that way. So Rather than perhaps obligations to others. I think we've got time for perhaps two more questions. We've got one here. A lot of what people have been saying throughout this has been to do with sort of milestones that you reach at middle age. And yet at the same time, everyone's been sort of saying that we don't really have those defined milestones anymore. People don't get married straight out of school, your career doesn't finish at 65, and your marriage doesn't last from marriage till the end of your life anymore. I mean, we just don't live in that kind of very defined society that I can see. And I think, you know, what a lot of people have said about physical problems and emotional problems, there are plenty of youthful diabetics, there are plenty of young, depressed people. So maybe what I'm asking is, how much of the problems that people encounter with middle age and with sort of accepting ageing and entering old age have to do with the fact that we don't live in a society where you can tick the boxes of, I've achieved all the milestones appropriate for a 65-year-old, now I don't have to worry about it anymore. I mean, do we, do we sort of live in a society where the concept of being in a particular age group doesn't matter? Is that why people, we're all comparing ourselves to youth and then some of us are not as young as a 16-year-old or as a 25-year-old, but we don't really have that sort of sense that there are, there are points that you've reached in life that are relevant to you that are less relevant to a 16-year-old or a 25-year-old. Yeah, I think there are, it's a very interesting point you raise. I think one of the, the things I, that I think we should um, try and bring out is that uh, it's important not to be arguing that any age is better than any other age, in that sense. That middle age is any better than people who are young. And uh, I do a lot of research with adolescents, and one thing riles me up, and that's a kind of stereotype about adolescence as being trouble, young, stupid, <coughs> rebellious, all of that kind of stuff. And I see it as a stereotype, just as I see the stereotype of middle-aged people as being kind of out of it, they can't use Facebook, they're kind of incompetent, what would they know, they can't even use a DVD player. So what you see is this kind of grouping kind of thing that I'm this age and they're that age and I belong to them. I'm middle-aged, so young people must be young and stupid. Um, older people are just beyond it. And I think that that's kind of a very negative way of constructing it. So I, I think that's a really good point. The, the other kind of points you were making is that, yeah, some of these issues are lifelong issues. No matter what age you are, they just kind of can manifest, manifest slightly different at different times in your life, depending on the context, as Michael was saying. I guess, you know, we're talking about middle age as a kind of generic context. But every individual is living their life in their own way and their context is, contexts are all different. So we are speaking in generalities. I think that is very true. Um, it's very hard to kind of try and do, speak about every particular, particular person's life uh, trajectory in that way. But I think there are just some themes that come through more strongly in middle age than they do when you're younger or they do when you're older. Themes such as mortality, themes such as caring, themes such as managing relationships with your partner, intimate relationships. How do I manage it when it falls apart? How do I get a new relationship going? All of those things tend to just happen more for that age group. But of course, they can be similar themes when you're older. Uh, there's no reason why you can't st start new relationships when you're 80, of course, and you do it when you're 18. <laughs> but they just manifest kind of in slightly different ways. So I guess, like, you know, I think, yeah, we're all human. So, so these issues are important for all of us. Uh, uh, getting to, uh, to Don's point, I want to know what 18-year-old 18, 18 boy does not want a Ferrari. <laughs> the only difference is Don can afford it. <laughs> and that's very important, right? So to kind of say, oh, look at that old guy over there. Yeah, he's got a Ferrari. He's just trying to be young. No, no, he's always wanted one. He couldn't get one when he was 18. <laughs> uh, we live in a world, you know, where, and so, you know, middle age, positively for many of us, not for, not for everybody, and I appreciate that very much so, but for many of us, we are now at a position of, financial security and so on and so we can go off and we can buy the things the Ferraris it's not a nice it's not a crisis 
I kind of can buy it. <laughs> End of story. Because I'm secure. Okay. C can I just correct one point? I can't afford a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two 18-year-old sons who would love a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let's, let's end it on that note. It's been a fantastic discussion. Could you please thank Susie Keeser, Ross Wilkinson, Michael Plato, Tim Windsor, Christine Phillips, and old bloke on the end. <laughs> 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 Can we thank Genevieve as well, who is a fantastic facilitator.